Hello Booktube, and welcome back to your Daily Penguin. This is our slow waddle of the penguins through my Penguin Classic wall, book by book, uh, author by author, type by type. Uh, we are in the Dark Ages, the so-called Dark Ages, we're in the Middle Ages, uh, bouncing all around. I, I briefly the other day ha looked at the shelf, I often go over to the Penguin shelf just to spend time. Uh, and noticed that these books are, a lot of them, and the, this March of the Penguins is showing up uh, out of chronological order. And my first urge was to fix that as though I were creating the syllabus for a class. And uh, I stopped myself because I'm not. I'm not doing that. I didn't set up these, these shelves in that order. All I'm doing is going book by book. This is, this is a very personal tour through the books that have meant the most to me over time. Uh, and so... We were, we're bound to have overlaps in time. We're bound to have bouncing around in terms of influence, where I will one day talk about someone and then the next day talk about someone I should have talked about before them because they were, they were a strong literary or cultural influence. And you're just going to have to not let that bother you. <laughs> That's all. And today we're doing uh, a, an odd Penguin volume, uh, uh, two little books in one, historical works rather than literary. These are Two Lives of Charlemagne who was the, you know, 8th century ruler of the Franks, of the Romans. He was a, a innovative and massively charismatic uh, ruler over a vast amount of territory by the time he finally popped his clogs. Uh, and he created an enormous uh, sort of thumbprint on his era and the eras immediately following his. There's been some, a lot of debate uh, in the last century about what the nature of that thumbprint was. I've noticed that a lot of the, a lot of the debating is very similar in terms to a similar debate that happens with Napoleon Bonaparte, where people can look at the size, the sheer size, the sheer numbers of people involved, the sheer uh, ubiquity of this person in their own personal, in their own historical record. But the question becomes: Was there a long-lasting effect of any kind, or was this really a sort of an autocratic bubble? Uh, and I've noticed that the, the, in uh, I've read. Uh, quite a few Charlemagne biographies aside from these two. I've read recent ones. Uh, and the, that debate continues. People, people wondering, you know, if... In, in, it, people wondering in kind of a limiting way, I think, that if this person isn't directly affecting or didn't directly contribute to our world today, why should we study them? Uh, but there was no doubt in the, in the mind of these two men, Einhardt and Notka the, sna the Stammerer, there was no doubt in their minds that Charlemagne was the biggest thing in their world and therefore well worthy of study, and also uh, a guarant guaranteed a soft reception for your book if you write a book about Charlemagne. Now, these are very different men. Einhardt knew Charlemagne and was his friend and was present for a lot of the things that he describes in his little life of Charlemagne. Uh, but, and, but that is not true of Notka the Stammerer. Notka the Stammerer was born in the same year that Einhardt died. So he... he wrote his little book about Charlemagne, which is very different in tone, long after the era of Charlemagne, but still in that general penumbra, still in that that uh, that great sphere of influence of people who who thought that this was the greatest ruler of their era and didn't really question anything about long-lasting effects or any of any kind like that. Uh, Notger wrote a different kind of book. He wrote a more anecdotal, more... Uh, uh, compartmentalized. It's it's not really. It isn't meant to to really uh, tell you the life of Char of Charlemagne so much as to tell you stand out bits and pieces from that life. And it's very entertaining. They both are actually. Einhardt is uh, is also a very good, very passionate writer. You have to dig around a little in him. You have to listen for his cadences before you can understand what he's trying to say. He's being diplomatic in a lot of cases, and he's also a cheerleader for his friend and patron. Uh, so that he will, whenever he mentions anything about Charlemagne, in that something, no matter what it is, Charlemagne will always be the best person at that something. Uh, I have a, uh, an example that I want to give you here uh, of one of Charlemagne's curious personal habits, which was his love of swimming. Uh, uh, let's see here. He, uh, Einhardt tells us this. He spent much of his time on horseback and out hunting, which came naturally to him, for it would be difficult to find another race on earth who could equal the Franks in this activity. This is by Lewis Thorpe. This translation is by Lewis Thorpe. It's very good. Uh, 
Uh, he took delight in steam baths at the thermal springs and loved to exercise himself in the water whenever he could. He was an extremely strong swimmer, and in this sport, no one could surpass him. See what I mean? It's, he always does that, no matter what it is, whether it's, whether it's drinking or, or his kindness to his many wives or uh, his ruling, his, his, his uh, deep philosophical thoughts. No matter what it is, he's always the best at it. Uh, uh, it was for this reason that he built his palace and remained continuously in residence there during the last years of his life and indeed until the moment of his death. He would invite not only his sons to bathe with him, but his nobles and friends as well, and occasionally even a crowd of his attendants and bodyguards, so that sometimes a hundred men or more would be in the water together. <laughs> that kind of a neat little image uh, is something that this author does all the time. Th those crop up all throughout Einhardt's account. The only difference in, in tone and in seriousness is that you know that he was one of those men. You know that he's not, unlike unlike Notgar, you know that he's not uh, just relaying Alfred and the Cakes type things. He, he's not relaying whatever story happens to be lying around about this guy. Most of what he relates, I think there's a good likelihood that he actually knew about, that he was actually personally present for, or knew people who'd been personally present for. That's valuable. That's very valuable. And it's wise of Penguin. It was wise of Lewis Thorpe. It's wise of Penguin to put these two together to underscore that. The, the one shows us how, how valuable, how rare it is to have that kind of a conscientious first-hand account of something from history. And the other shows us how readily uh, writers collected Suetonius-style anecdotes and traditions about famous figures. They're two different kinds of things. If we didn't have Einhard, we would value Notgar still, because you'd have to, you'd have to sift and x-ray all the most of the things that he writes about Charlemagne quite a bit to get at the truth, but there is still truth there to get at. We would value that as as being just incredible, incredibly useful in understanding the time. If we didn't have Einhardt, now we get to see them side by side, and it's a it's a a mark of genius to put the two of them together in a book like that. Radically different approaches to the same figure. Uh, so that, that is your Penguin Classic today. This is the Lewis Thorpe translation of Two Lives of Charlemagne. I wouldn't doubt that this is still in print. This is one of those penguins that is just such a terrific job that I've had, I had the mass market paperback forever and ever. My mass market paperback actually dried out because somebody left it on top of a radiator, one of those box encased radiators. Uh, somebody put it on top of that at a library study carol. And then we went out and for lunch and left our stuff behind. It was a totally deserted library at, at, the, at that time on that floor. And I didn't know about it, and I came back, and my book had been baked. It wasn't a fire hazard in any way, but it, it, the, after that, it was so stiff that it cracked open when I used it. So I had that mass market. I had one before that. Now I have this trade paperback, and uh, I go back to these. They're, neither Einhardt nor Notker knew, of course. They didn't have any idea what was coming. They had no idea that their book would still be read in a thousand years. I think most, both of them probably thought the world would be over by then. Uh, but so they don't even know the entertaining and fascinating way in which they're relating the details of a lost world to us, to our, to readers now. So I go back to this and, and, uh, I don't think, uh, that Penguin could really surpass it. I think it's, it's one of these medievalist volumes that they just do so well that you just reprint this from now on. That's all. Just continue to reprint this one. That would be my advice. Uh, so that is your that is your Penguin Classic for today. Is uh, an, uh, a Middle Ages ruler and the literature that sprang up around him. And we're going to do the exact same thing tomorrow. Can you guess? <laughs> Can you guess who the ruler is going to be? <laughs> well, let's just put it this way. He knew all about Charlemagne. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up and we'll meet again tomorrow. Thank you, BookTube.